Uh, so Michael is co-founder and CTO of Parstream, and he's going to talk to us about uh, from M2M data to IoT data analytics, uh, which is a, a very interesting topic right now. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, it's, uh... so, thank you very much. And the big question is, do you want to have marketing show or sales? So we're not loyal to... Or do you want to have some engineering-driven content? Um, that shows a little bit about how we think about the future of IoT. And just to give you, Germans cannot be really funny, but I tried anyhow to wake you up a little bit. Um, if you open a sushi shop with your good friends and you tell others about this shop, in the US you would say, hey, I have opened this great sushi shop selling the freshest fish you have ever seen in your life. It's tasty, it's sweet, it's soft, and when you eat it, you feel 20 years younger. If a German would tell the same story to his friend, he would say, we opened a shop and we are selling cold dead fish. <laughs> As I said, Germans cannot be funny, but some can, some can't. Thank you very much for that comment. I'm supposed to talk a little bit about the difference between M2M and IoT. And I decided not to do a sales pitch for Parstream. I decided to talk about how we see the world and how we think it will change over the next year. And the first click uh, is, is IoT actually just a new name for M2M? And we say, no, we don't think so. Because IoT for us, is a huge amount of data. We actually start with a billion data records and more. We talk about data import rates of a million and more per second, million measurements per second. We talk about real-time analytics that you get, need to get insights very, very fast from your data because we all know that the value of data degrades rapidly over time. So if you find out tomorrow that actually your wind turbine was not turned into the wind, that is actually pretty bad. You should find it out much earlier. And edge analytics is something I want to talk more uh, because we will have apparently 50 billion devices. Now imagine all of them are sending continuously data. Our networks will not be strong enough to transfer all of this data into a central cloud. And actually, it makes no sense. So we will talk about edge analytics. Uh, the first difference I see between M2M and IoT is simply, for me, M2M is a siloed approach. This means you build sensors into, let's say, a bus or an, uh, an asset, you transfer the data, probably over a proprietary network, you store it, and you put one application on top of it. You want to monitor availability or do predictive maintenance. So you have siloed solutions. IoT for me is a much more integrated horizontal approach. You have horizontal data platforms. They collect the data from the sensors. They bring it together. Maybe not physically, but logically, you bring the data together. And then you put different applications on this data. And you can add an application if you have a new idea. And if you then use the vibration data of uh, the wind turbine, not just to shut it down if it vibrates too much, but maybe also indirectly measure how good the bearing is. That is a new application, and you can run it on the same data infrastructure. And that is the advantage of IoT. It provides you with way more flexibility in finding new use cases and run it on the same infrastructure. So reuse is a big topic. Second statement, embedded analytics. Currently, we have operational, real-time transactional systems and we have analytical systems. We have guys who take care of production facilities. They have to make sure that 1,000 units are produced in this hour. And we have the data scientists, and they always try to figure out what's the problem and try to tell these production guys what they could do better. And these two worlds are very, very hard to bring together. You see it in the equipment they use. In production, you use CEP engines for monitoring and data historians for archiving data. I did not use the word analytics because 
that is the domain of the data scientists. And they use a Hadoop data lake or whatever data lake approach, if at all. So how do you bring these two worlds together? And what we will see, and I learned a new abbreviation about two days ago, that was intelligent business process management solutions. Wow. It actually means you have a BPM, and it can do analytics while you run the business process. And I think that is interesting. If you look into how to assign your maintenance people to maintaining a wind turbine, at every step, you have a piece of analytics. You have to make decisions. And every time you have to make a decision, you have to run analytics. And this, as an integral part of your operating platform, that is interesting. And this means you get not five queries a day, you get 50,000 queries, 100,000 queries a day. You not have 10 users who do data scientists, do advanced analytics. You have every user in your organization is also an analytics user. And I think we will see that. Makes a big difference for the analytical platform. You don't need a data warehouse. You need a much better platform to actually run that on. And number three, decentralization. I talked already about that. The data is created at the edges of the network, mostly. Does it really make sense to take every sensor reading into a central cloud infrastructure to get it together and analyze it there? No, it doesn't. There are much more uh, differentiated approaches where you only hold a part of the data in a centralized cloud infrastructure for analytics. But if you want to do, for example, root cause analysis and contextual analytics, or you want to run advanced analytics on large amounts of granular data, you actually execute the query where the data was created. You can leave the data very close to its origin and collect it there and store it there and move the query to where the data is stored and not the other way around. Decentralized infrastructures a lot of companies offer that at the moment for stream processing, decentralized stream processing to reduce the data volumes. We actually store the data, for example, at a cell tower and have a data record for every IP package that goes through about 10 billion a day, and then do analytics over all of the cell towers together. Just one example. That's not China, but the customer is actually in China. It's Envision. It's one of the largest wind turbine manufacturers. They're using PathStream. And by using a much better analytical technique and algorithms and running them on the real-time data in combination with historical data, i.e. do anomaly detection, predictive maintenance, and more complex analytics, they can increase the output of wind parks by 15%. 15% more electricity out of a wind park by better analytics. In numbers, these are millions per year from the wind parks by better analytics. Very simple thing. Local, uh, 150 to 1,000 sensors per wind turbine, locally collected at a wind park, locally analyzed, but also doing global benchmarking between the wind parks. Very simple. I'm actually done. If you ask what PathStream is, we are exactly in the middle of this layered architecture. So we work together with all these data collection providers that collect the data over networks, and they stream it into PathStream. And in PathStream, we store the data, and we provide an analytical layer, a so-called execution engine. So you can speak SQL with us. With every application that speaks SQL can speak with us, and we just store the data and provide advanced analytics and standard SQL-based analytics on billions of data records. That's our job. And I want to mention Plat1. Sorry if Ken Foster is here from Plat1. I forgot your logo last time I pitched that chart. I really apologize for that. These are partners of us, and we work closely with them together. And PathStream is actually the database and some IoT-specific components on top. So we are the horizontal layer that stores your data and provides super-fast analytics on that. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>